All right. Uh, I'm Su Jin Li, or Li Su Jin. Maybe the order doesn't matter. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. And I'm this year's uh, student winner, obviously. <laughs> and I'll talk about, uh, in general, how do I get to know about APL and the contest. And I'll talk about uh, my two solution, and and maybe rumble uh, why I like this language and and some something else I see. <laughs> yeah, I'm Tsuchinui. It is written like this, uh, just for display purpose. And I'm from Taiwan. It's quite far from here. I'm currently a master's student at a National Tsinghua University. And I'm studying quantum algorithm uh, with my professor. And I'm interested in um, array languages, combinator stuff, and in general function programming thing. And for other thing, I quite like geography and drawing some math and anime stuff. It's quite obvious. <laughs> and oh, this is from Taiwan, and this is my school's logo. <laughs> and let me uh, tell you the story how I found APL. <laughs> it's about my first year in grad school. At the time, I wa the only language I kind of knew is C++, so I think I should sharpen my skill on it for obvious reason for job purposes or something else. So I just binge watching, binge watch uh, uh, talks on YouTube. And at that time I start uh, switch my daily driver on to Linux. So I get to use uh, the piping syntax in the, uh, in the shell a lot. And I find that quite useful and I, I want my, I want, um, I wish I can programming in the similar way. From that, I know about more about uh, the functional programming stuff. And from the functional programming stuff, absolutely, you will um, get lead to the Haskell. And I play play the language for a while, and. With my and I find Connor's YouTube video, <laughs> and that's where I found APO. And for the next two years, I start to listen to the podcast and know more thing about APO and um, array languages in general, and get to know about BQN and APO and the. Uh, Dialog competition. And at 2021, 20, I also try to solve some uh, advent of code uh, with APL. Yeah, it's quite fun, but I only got several uh, problems done in APL, mostly in C. <laughs> yes. And, and I have to, I'm going to tell about why I like APO. The first one is the glyphs. I like them a lot. <laughs> they are kind of cute. <laughs> yes. The second one is, second thing is it's very concise. In C++, you have to do, if you want to do reduction, you have to write all these things. And if you it's just two symbols, two keystrokes. Maybe for things I use the back tick. <laughs> yeah. And the other thing is algorithm as primitive. Before uh, before learning C, I don't even uh, think problems in modulation or sub. Because C has a glyph for modulation. So in it's quite natural people start to think start to use modulation in their solution or in in solving problem, 
and in, in APL, you have more, uh, more glyphs for more algorithms. So you can, um, it's kind of natural to use algorithms like just like other arithmetic uh, primitives. And I think this is, it, it expands your tools, yes. And, and the operators. Since uh, before I found APOs, I first get into the functional lens. Operators is kind of like higher order function. I know they are not equivalent, but they act similarly. So I like it. And finally, the combinator and the trains. And it is was mentioned that it, the new added uh, constant combinator is quite useful for learning trains in general, since I always find that with a uh, left argument Left vector argument in the train is kind of strange thing, but if you reason it as a syntax sugar or something uh, of the constant operator, then it is quite easy to reason about this case. Yeah. And this is my first train. I, this is the first train I saw. It's uh, obvious also in Connor's video. <laughs> he was solving some event of code problem and he just typed this thing to split the input and I say I, I was, um, uh, it blew my mind <laughs> since if you want to do the same thing in C++ or in Python, you have to type a lot of things and um, you don't always get to know how thing is done. And in APL, you just, you can reason about each glyph and how they combine, then you can know about everything just from the source code. You don't have to look other files. Yes. Uh, another thing I just uh, found out is how expressive the combinators are. And I was a TA for some uh, signal system soft last semester, and in that class, a homework problem is one to one students to prove the linearity of some systems. And linearity is uh, composed of two uh, properties: additivity and homogeneity. And in standard math, we will. Uh, they are written like these two equation. And when tra translate them into APL, it can be written like this. And here we see a very familiar pattern. <laughs> yes. And with combinators, they can be uh, translated into these two expressions. I find uh, they are very neat. And since they are uh, point three, they don't mention the argument, and they are, they quite show the symmetry symmetry of the two equation. And in the uh, good old math equation, it's kind of hard to reason about these two equation or, or see how they are related. Yeah, or um, it's just nice to look at it. I think <laughs> it's quite beautiful. Then let's talk about the competition. Uh, as uh, previous, previously stated, there are six problems. And sadly, I didn't even finish the last one. <laughs> I was stuck in the passing part I was, since I want to find a, a more beautiful solution to myself. <laughs> so I just stuck at the parsing. <laughs> Yes, and I'm going to talk about problem two and problem five today. The problem two is reshaping reshape. It's kind of, uh, you have to extend what reshape do. Yes, you have to e extend the reshape. So it's left argument can contain negative values. And in, they are integers. 
obviously, and the uh, output is reversed along those axes. Uh, here are some ex example. If you reshape one, two, three by five, they just repeat your data. If you reshape with the negative value, it, uh, it kind of do the reshape, but reverse on the, the only axis here. And for if there are negative value in other places, they just reshape according to where they are. And it should all also works for, uh, I know, uh, big array. <laughs> higher order array or something. Yes, and here is my solution to the problem. I kind of like um, build the function first, then after that I compose them. So it's like, kind of like plumbing. You just um, stick your uh, pipes together, and after that you can put the liquid into it, <laughs> and the answer just falls out. And here is the kind of like the schematic of the solution. I first find out where, which axis I have to reverse, and I just uh, do the old reshape. After that, oh, it is through this problem I found out that the reduction in appeals it actually uh, begins from right. <laughs> so I have to re append the reshaped uh, reshape array at the end. Then finally, the reduction job flips exact each axis. And I'm kind of at, um, adding pick or uh, first ad hoc. <laughs> yes. The next text is reshape tool. We have to extend the previous uh, function. So it now can take uh, some half values. And they also can be uh, positive or negative. Yes. And for each, uh, yes. for each uh, value, they, the function should do different things. If the value is plus or minus 0.5, it truncates the data before uh, passing the data into the reshape we just wrote. And if it's 1.5, it repeats the data, like the good old reshape do. And the last one, if it is 2.5, it just pad the data and pad it with the um, um, corresponding Scalars. So uh, the problem actually stated like what x takes y do. So yeah, let's see some example. Yeah. Uh, oops. Yes. Here uh, we reshape to 0.56. So and since uh, we have seven elements, but we only have the first row only have six six slots, so we drop the last one, and the uh, result is like this. If it's one point five, we repeat our data. If it's two point five, we just fill it in with uh, zeros for our numeric uh, input. And if the input is uh, uh, Consider several cells. <laughs> Actually, I don't know how to how it should be called, but there should be a blank appended. And after that, it should the reverse should also work. And here's my solution. When I was solving this problem, I I I don't know why, but I want to avoid using um, conditional statement. So there is no guard here. Uh, it's kind of like find, uh, bending the language to uh, what I want to do. <laughs> yes. So we first uh, find out where the special dimensions are and what the special value is. Next, we uh, calculate 
uh, we just assume the that special dimension is in length one and calculate how many elements will 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 be in the end. Yes. And line six is, is kind of or the comment one is what I submitted. Uh, the trend here is kind of tedious, so I s <laughs> simplify it uh, to this. And the line sync is, uh, returns the padded size, the, like uh, if the input is one and it returns it its all size, if the input is zero. So I can, it's kind of like a conditional statement, but without the conditional, without the guard, yeah. And after that, we have to find out uh, what the actual length of the special dimension. So we uh, calculate how many elements we have, then we just uh, divide the unit out and times it the sign of the special value to get a, what it should be in that position. And before we passing everything, before we pass everything into reshape, uh, we have to take uh, the superball amount of elements uh, in events. So we just find out how many elements we should take. And what I like about this solution is uh, if there is no special value. The, then we couldn't find any, any of them. So this will be Zeld. I don't know if it should be pronounced like that. So everything that touches SPD will become Zeld. The unit will kind of disappear. And, and SPID will be disappear. And since you assign to uh, indexing of that is kind of like no up, and you take nothing, so everything just falls back to the reshape when there is no uh, special value. Yes, I find this. I'm just playing around. I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they, huh, I mean, they they told me that they want to see my code in production. I but I think this. Um, should not be in the production code. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the uh, other problem is base 85. Yeah. Base 85. Base 85 is uh, kind of like base uh, 64. It represents uh, binary data by ASCII code. And it uses five ASCII characters to represent four bytes. And base 64 use four characters to encode three bytes, so it's more expensive. And the task is to write a directive function, base 85, which takes a character vector as its left argument. And it's guaranteed that it is in length 85. And a vector as its right argument. If that vector is numeric, and it is guaranteed that it will um, be in the range of 0 to 255. Uh, we have to encode the right argument to the card vector according to the rule of base 85. If it, if it is a character vector, we have to decode it. But before decoding, we have to make sure that we only decode the valid part of the new uh, the vector. Yeah, here are some <laughs> crazy examples. <laughs> here, here is a, uh, I don't show this, but it is uh, uh, the problem statement says this is uh, quite of the kind of the standard character set. And here, Q O is the standard character set, and Q is called I, I just uh, scramble. Uh, string character set, yes. And 
with uh, numeric input, since uh, it is translated by the UCS, call UCS, so it becomes a numeric vector. Then in base 85 encodes the input to a character vector, like this, just kind of like a scramble, <laughs> a dribbish. And if we put the thing back into base 85, it should give us the same output. And if there are some string character that are not in the character set, we should ignore them. And, and the base 85 should kind of, if you feed them uh, to itself twice, it should come out as the same value as you passing to it. Yes. And when preparing this talk, I find out if you can use two disjoint character sets, you can kind of uh, fuse to uh, encoding text together. So here is the fuse text, then you can decode it uh, with different character set to get a different message out. And let's talk about how base 85 works. Uh, it's kind of, uh, the decoding and encoding is kind of a mirror of each other. And to decode the uh, base 85, uh, string, you have to pad your input to length of multiple of five with the last character in the character set. After that, you find where the character uh, lives in the character set, and which is its index, and translate that index from base 85 to base 256. And after that, you just drop how many, as many things as you pad it in here. And the encode part is quite similar, but uh, you do the reversing here, and you pad zero to the multiple four at the beginning. Yes. And I have heard that, uh, oh no, well, I should say another thing. <laughs> First, and around the same time, I find out uh, John Scholes' videos on the, uh, the Game of Life, and at the end of that video, he talked about dialogue creature page, that you can kind of simulate the Game of Life on different manifolds, and I was curious, uh, curious how it's done. Then it is done with some DOP, and I find that that's where I first get to know about what actually the double alpha means. <laughs> I kind of seen it a lot, but I didn't know what it means. So I just kind of try to use the up in this problem. And I also heard that uh, you can inverse your, take the negative power of your function. Yes, so I use them in here. And uh, basically, the first seven line correspond to the uh, button two block, two block here. So with uh, operator, you can kind of like pre-process your input and feed it to uh, this, this part. And after that, you will just drop the uh, suitable amount of things. Yes. And I find it's quite useful. Here, this is a train, but, uh, and I think it, it's uh, quite readable, <laughs> uh, contrast to some people say. Actually, in my opinion, the problem, people's problem with train is more about operator. If you have many operators in your trains, you kind of hard to uh, dissect which uh, uh, the unit of the train, yeah. And we here we just uh, find the index of our input and we adjust for quad I O one and decoding base eighty five and calls back to base two hundred fifty six. 
So now the decode and encode is quite straightforward. It just uh, decoding is just a transform transform under uh, the reshape, and the reshape is parameterized by the last element in the character set, and we we want to. Um, uh, they called five, like the five character for four bytes. Yeah, and before that we have to filter out uh, the invalid stuff. And the encode is quite symmetric, quite similar to decode. We just we only have to put the negative one here, so everything just follows similarly. Yeah. And I find out how to. Like check if the input is character, char it consists of character or numbers on Google. And I stumbled up somebody else already asked the question on Stack Overflow, and and I think the uh, the design um, is quite nice. You can just check the last digit of your uh, data representation outcome. Yes. And after, this is what I submitted for the contest. And when I preparing this talk, I've sit, um, I kind of uh, find out the decode and encode are not, are not so symmetric. Here we have a constant here, but we have a Kind of like a expression here, and here we don't do the pre and we don't do the filtering part. So I kind of uh, thinking like, if we have alpha for decode, then we should have another vector for encode, <laughs> and such vector should consist only the valid numbers we have. So it should be in the range of 0 to 255. And it would be nice that 0 is its last argument, uh, its last element. So, and yeah, so I just uh, put in <laughs> alta 256, or, and I also adjust the quad IO to get rid of the negative one here. Now, it becomes more symmetric. And after this, we can merge all the DOP here into one DOP for uh, space efficiency, I think. I think. <laughs> and since we kind of repeat ourselves here, we can put uh, this part and filter it into our DOP then you'll get something like this. And here is the filtering part, and here is what we had. Now, we can see we have some magic number here. I don't like magic number. <laughs> and we have 256. Where it comes from is, I think it's come from the length of A. And A T5 is come from the alpha. So we locate where they come from, and the magic number left are five and four. So we can just kind of lift the uh, function so it becomes an operator that we can parameterize. We can just change the five and four by my by uh, on our own. So the re the operator chop encode bytes stand for we use five character to encode four bytes. Then now the base 84 is just like what it is defined. And at the beginning we have mentioned that it's kind of its sibling, base 64, which encode three bytes by four characters. So now we can just define base 64 with the same operator, but uh, since base 64 uh, traditionally has uh, some default character set and you have to pad your encoded results. So you have 
I have to wrap something around it. Yeah. <laughs> and I find it's quite uh, uh, satisfying <laughs> to reuse uh, the same code for similar stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And here are some advice for future participants. Uh, the first one is just do experiments. You don't have to uh, know the language a lot to uh, particip participate the contest. Uh, since you have the interpreter in front of you, so you can just type whatever you want. And if the interpreter gets angry, then you know you're wrong. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I actually uh, write my solution on write editor, and the log of my on the what on there is kind of 90% error, and only 10% was thing actually works. <laughs> yes. I, I used to, um, since I want to write some point-free uh, solution, uh, which is uh, just trains. So at the beginning, I just write one line, uh, defund, and omit the curly bracket and the uh, omega and think and hope it works. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that was uh, before I find out how train actually works. <laughs> yes. And, and it's quite funny, uh, at the same time, I just, if it doesn't work, I just uh, randomly add jot and a toggle over, over the place <laughs> and hope it will find thing together so uh, the Expression will be valid. <laughs> yes, and so you you can just do experiments. Yes, and you can try to achieve different goals. Um, I think the one for uh, reshape is actually quite challenging or quite fun for me to try to avoid the uh, guards, even if. Uh, I don't think it should be done. <laughs> in, production code, but you have a, a sophist sophisticated toy, you can play with it, and it's just the competition, so it don't hurt. <laughs> <laughs> or maybe you can bring, bring the server down if, it, <laughs> if you uh, try it, you know, things. And the third one is comment your code, yes. Yes, you, you, you should come in your call. When I prepared the talk, I go went back to see my code, and we saw the comment. I often, or even with the comment, I often find out I hard, I kind of hard to get what I was thinking about. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And the fourth one is rewrite your solution. Yeah, I kind of spend a lot of time like. Um, like in the example here, I try to like I add the uh, unnecessary one here, but I think I want to I want my solution to look uh, symmetric or something else. And when you're rewriting your code, your solution, you kind of find out where you can refactor your code or uh, some other design issue in your solution. Or maybe you will f you will uh, write another uh, completely different code uh, with different approach, and it's kind of uh, fun since APL actually uh, gives you the freedom to attack a problem from different angle. And since it just glyphs, <laughs> you can rewrite them very. Uh, Efforts uh, with, without many efforts, yeah. And the last one is just have fun, and, yeah. And if future participants want to get more resource, and many learn 
APO from videos and the interpreter, obviously. <laughs> and here are some results with links. I think the PDF will be uploaded later, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And there are some suggestions to the contest. And the first, first one is kind of uh, strange, but make sure the problem description gives all information. And I'm not sure if I get the old version of the problem statement, but in Base 65, the filtering was only mentioned in the example. And actually, in the problem description, it says it, it will give you a valid uh, character input if you have to decode the string. Yeah. So it's kind of uh, not so good. <laughs> and yes. And the naming style is more, more of the aesthetic part, since some function we have to write uh, are in the camel case, I assume, or you have to capitalize the first one, but some problems you don't have to. And, and I assume that is because uh, different people contribute to different problems, but for part in the uh, view of participant it may be not so not so good. <laughs> and uh, the last one is show scores and uh, waiting for for those score after the contest. I, it will be helpful helpful not uh, helpful to know how you pr perform on the contest and if you get if you didn't get the full point on the correctness, you can go back to check your solution again and and the and whether to publish it is uh, I have no opinions on that, but uh, maybe some people have strong opinions on that. But personally, I think uh, it's good to let the uh, contestant know he or she his or hers. <laughs> Uh, perf performance on the on the solution they submitted. Yes, and the last one is kind of I don't like this. <laughs> I want I want uh, what is called the uh, after the jot bar thing. <laughs> yes, I don't want to flip the argument uh, one time and then flip it back. I don't. Yes, it's quite it's hard to read. <laughs> Reason about the uh, the train uh, the operator here. Yes. Yes, but <laughs> but you can kind of use jot for the left if you want to dangle a G on the right. You should be able to dangle a G on the left with the similar effort. <laughs> yes, in my opinion, right. And here are my future plans. Yes, I have to know more about these <laughs> primitive. <laughs> I'm not <laughs> familiar with them at all. So it actually proves you don't have to uh, very skill in the APL to win the contest. <laughs> yes, yeah. And the second thing is I. I uh, solved the problem in it right, and the other thing that is nice to that is very helpful is the dialog strip. Since I use Linux, I often just type the plain text and run use the shebang to run the the script. So on the other hand, that makes me uh, not so familiar with the system stuff. I actually don't know how to write to the file. <laughs> I just uh, print out to uh, stood out and <laughs> piping to the file. <laughs> yes, right now. Yes, so I have to get to know about them. And this, the the third one is try and try all the array languages like BQ and since uh, I've more like uh, the. Uh, actually, I kind of want I can manip 
manipulate uh, function like first class citizens. It's kind of hard to uh, build another function without using execute in APO. I don't think it is possible, or maybe it is. I'm not sure, but I couldn't find a way to do that. And finally, just do more projects in array languages in general. So, yes. And maybe theoretical aspect of array languages. Things I've kind, in my opinion, it seems like it's, I know the origin is come from math, and it, the shape stuff is kind of like some algebra thing. Yeah. I don't know if there, are, there if there were uh, any uh, academic research on these things. I'm not sure, but I will be, I will, I'm keen to uh, know more about it, yes. And do you have a question, or I just uh, uh, finished too early? I'm not sure. <laughs> yes, maybe we can finish early.